all doing? Good afternoon, and you're very welcome to the fourth annual All Ireland Smart Cities Forum, sponsored by the Irish Software Centre Lero, uh, the Innovation Value Institute, and Wisdom Aid University. And uh, this is the first time it's been held entirely online, as you may have noticed. So not only has COVID-19 fundamentally changed how events like this are held, uh, but has led to a seismic shift in how cities operate. Uh, the rapid deployment of pedestrianized streets, smart queuing systems, and even food delivery robots are becoming more commonplace as we find a way to control the spread of the coronavirus. And not only that, but the rapid adoption of 5G and its combination with the internet of things is giving cities even more potential to monitor and prepare for future health emergencies. Uh, so in a sense, it has sped up the already rapid transition we are seeing to smarter cities. Uh, and today's event will give the island of Ireland uh, insight into some of Europe's leading players in this space. So my name is Colin Gorey, I'm a senior journalist with Silicon Republic. And to give you a taste of what's to come, uh, our first session will look at how the cities of Milan and Cork are reimagining what it means to run a city, uh, from public transport to making roads more pedestrian friendly. Uh, our second session will explore the devastating impact COVID-19 has had on tourism and the aftershocks on income and life within our cities. We'll hear from Salzburgland in Austria on the importance of being agile in response to these COVID-19 restrictions. While tourism, Northern Ireland gives insight on how a digitally enabled tourism sector is essential right now. Now, unfortunately, our keynote speaker for the third session, Professor Carlos Moreno, uh, will not be able to attend today's event uh, due to travel disruptions, but he does send his deepest apologies. Uh, but we will steer his concept for his 50 minute city, so stay tuned for that. And um, we'll be joined by a panel of leading authorities from Spain and the island of Ireland on how we can connect communities like never before as well. So. Stay tuned for that. And then finally, uh, Fingal County Council Chief Executive Anne-Marie Farley and Belfast City Council uh, Digital Innovation Commissioner, Dr. Jane Brady, will discuss what the future holds for local government during these extraordinary times. And don't forget to share your tweets and social posts using the hashtag uh, AISCF20. Also, if you have any questions to post for speakers and panelists today, uh, you can do so via the chat function that we'll get to at the latter half of the, the session. Um, but first, I'm proud to introduce Professor Brian Donnellan, the All-Ireland Smart Cities Forum Chair and Vice President of Engagement and Innovation at Maynooth University for our welcoming address. Thank you. Um, this is uh, Brian. Uh, I'd, I'd like to welcome you to the fourth annual conference of the All-Ireland Smart Cities uh, Forum. The All-Ireland Smart Cities Forum is a community of practice uh, sorry, I'm just uh, switching on my video here. The All Ireland Smart Cities Forum is a community of practice focused on the advancement of cities in both north and south uh, of the island. So the, the forum is made up of city officials with a wealth of knowledge on everything to do with cities. And uh, they come together, we come together periodically to help, help each other, share best practices and, and uh, learn from each other. The um, uh, agenda today is, is particularly exciting and I'm looking forward to it. Uh, lots of really interesting international speakers and the themes are, are also uh, really, really engaging. Reimagining the city, transforming tourism, disrupting mobility, really hot topics. So I, I'm, I'm looking forward to a, a fascinating and engaging uh, afternoon. Um, so I, I, I uh, hope you enjoy the rest of the afternoon and I'm um, uh, actually, I should also acknowledge the organizing team from within the forum that uh, that worked so hard to set up today's event. Carolyn Creamer for, from Maynooth, Ashling Highland from Fingal, Paula, Paula Fee from Belfast, Claire Davis from Cork, and of course, uh, Anne Hamilton Black from the Social Sciences Institute in Maynooth. So um, welcome and uh, let's enjoy the rest of the day. Then we'll be on to our first session. Uh, where our speakers will discuss attempts to reimagine our spaces. So it's, it's not an understatement to say that in response to the coronavirus, high streets have had to be very agile uh, to a rapidly changing situation. Uh, with case numbers rising again and businesses struggling, uh, cities and towns across Europe and Ireland are finding innovative ways of keeping cities safely open for business. Uh, one such innovator is Roberta Coco. Uh, she's the deputy mayor for digital transformation for the city of Milan since 2016. Uh, her work's objective is to simplify and improve the public services offered to citizens while accelerate, accelerating the growth of Milan as an international innovation hub. So without further ado, I'm very happy to introduce you to Roberto Coco. Uh, hello, everyone. Can you hear me? 
Yes, go ahead. Okay. Go, go ahead, Roberta. Uh -huh. Roberta. So you can you can see my screen. Yes. Okay, perfect. First of all, thank you very much to the organizer of this uh, seminar webinar because I'm, I'm really proud to be with you today and to share our experience. My name is Roberta Cocco and I am the deputy mayor for digital transformation. I do not have a background in politics. I come from the private sector. I was for 25 years in a nice city multinational company. So I uh, accepted uh, uh, this uh, job to take part of my experience in, in the public sector. Let me tell you something about uh, uh, Milan. Uh, I, I like to start the story uh, from uh, uh, 2019, where Milan was on the rise. And Milan is very well known for fashion, design, culture, cutting edge architecture. It's also the economic engine of Italy. And so our citizen uh, had always had a big aspiration based uh, on three main priorities, sustainability, community, and digital transformation. Let me share something about that. When we speak about sustainability, uh, we have been working for years to be a fully sustainable city. We, are, we have a huge project to plant more than 3 million trees. And our main goal is to be carbon neutral by 2050. And digital innovation is our best ally in the path of environmental transition. New technologies can help us in, in many ways, and we will see our second big challenge and the scope was technology. Technology for us is not the final goal, but it should be an enabler to do things. Since the beginning of our uh, mandate, we had a complete uh, uh, digital transformation plan, which is based on two main aspects. From one side, technology. So we work to reinforce infrastructure and to develop more and more digital services. On the other side, we also wanted to share digital culture because we want to use technology as a lever of inclusion. Not we have to bridge a very huge digital gap in Italy. So we had to use technology to embrace more and more people. Creativity and innovation is our third uh, mainstream. And so we want to engage uh, all kinds of communities uh, uh, from the business side and the personal side. So we created, for example, a condition for more than 2,000 innovative startups and social innovation incubators and hubs. We also worked to share the value of digital skills for uh, kids and the students. And we have a main project which is called STEM in the City, who reached more than 30,000 students and uh, um, helped them to understand the value of completing their personal profile with digital skills. So we were on the rise with all this project. And then February 2020 and the pandemic arrived and the lockdown closed everything. This is our main cathedral, the Duomo of Milan. I really hope that uh, many of you uh, have visited it in the past. Uh, I have to share with some difficulty that for 70 days, 10 million people and over 100,000 businesses in Milan and the region 
were placed in lockdown. So uh, what uh, we used to remember as the most vibrant city in Italy became a deserted city. And so what we did, first of all, we had to understand how we could react to this terrible situation because the virus was faster than us. And so we based our reaction on data. In our previous years, we had a, a huge work on data. So we um, summarized all the data we had within the public administration and that we had organized in a unique smart lake. And so we used this capacity of a data-driven project to face the enormous difficulties that the pandemic was, uh, uh, was, was making. And so we had to shift immediately from shock to action. We worked to understand which were the most critical uh, situation. Uh, on, on, on your um, left, you see one of the city map that we processed because we received overall more than 44,000 requests of help. And so technology was essential to make good projects uh, in order to address uh, all these requests. But at the same time, we also had to leverage uh, the human capital that we had. So uh, we uh, engaged thousands of volunteers uh, to help us to distribute, for example, 60 tons per week of food for the, you know, the, the personal and families in need. At the same time, we moved, we, we boost the digital projects that we had on the website on mobile. One of my slogan is mobile first, one click. So during the pandemic, we had to accelerate the mobile services because uh, we were not sure that all people had uh, uh, a, a strong connection, a device in their home, in their houses. But we knew that every single citizen in Milan, they had a mobile phone. So we accelerated the development of all the digital services to be ready to use on mobile. And one number which is, I think, emblematic is 85% of certificates in that period were downloaded from the website or the mobile phones. And so people understood the value of having the services on their own mobile phone. At the same time, we had to keep something analog. This is a picture I'm very fond of because this is the first uh, um, uh, wedding which was celebrated after the lockdown. We had two months where we were not able to celebrate any, any wedding. Now we are at more than 2,000 weddings celebrated after the, the lockdown. Uh, Milano also had the, to renew uh, the, the capacity of attracting people and serving people after or in the pandemic. And so we um, realized that more than uh, 35 kilometers of bike lanes, we used uh, the um, uh, how, how the newsstands, we used more than 100 newsstands around the city 
to offer digital certificates to people uh, who were not able to do themselves. And we also worked with all the communities spread uh, around the city to understand what they needed as a first priority. Milano is now looking forward. This is no more the same city we had in 2019. We are focusing on two main assets, digital uh, capacity, so digital levers and digital education. We have to help our students and our youth to be able to remain connected to their schools even in this pandemic uh, uh, situation. Sorry, we've got two minutes uh, left. Okay, so uh, my, my uh, last things, we uh, are working with uh, the mayor to collect all the feedbacks and information uh, how to reshape the city after the pandemic. And so we define seven different themes with seven working groups. We engaged more than 700 stakeholders. And during these days, we are having working groups all through digital tools in order to focus how we can reshape our city and our vision. So I really hope I was uh, uh, good enough to share with you how we worked. Let me just say one last thing because uh, my previous job in during uh, uh, in, in my previous job uh, when I was a, a professional in a private company, one of my country was Ireland. And uh, I had the honor to work for my Gov ID projects. I don't know what you think about my Gov ID, but I took this experience and I made a similar thing in Milan, which is the digital citizen folder. So we have for every single citizen in Milan the uh, possibility to go through an app or through the website and to find uh, all his or her certificates, documents, uh, all enrollment uh, uh, to schools for kids. And this uh, single project, which was very well appreciated, uh, was done thanks to, this was my counter, uh, okay was done thanks to the experience I had uh, in Ireland uh, with uh, my GovID. Great, thank you very much, Roberto. Uh, now, secondly, um, we have David Joyce. He is the Director of the Roads and Environment Operations Director, Directorate in Cork City Council. Uh, prior to this role, he led the City Council Transition Directorate, uh, which in 2019 delivered the boundary extension to the Council's administrative area, which is the largest change project in local government in Ireland in 25 years. So, David, I'll now hand over the floor to you. Thank you very much. Can you see my screen now? Thank you very much. I will kick off. So, we only have 12 minutes, so I'm going to fly through this very, very quickly. But if anybody has any questions afterwards on my contact details or at the end of the presentation as well, you can contact me about any of the, the items in the presentation. So just to put a little bit of context, um, obviously Cork City Council has some long-term strategic plans uh, or development plan, uh, which would include concepts such as a 15-minute city neighborhoods, uh, city centre living. Uh, we have some strategic transport plans as well, Cork Metropolitan Area Strategic Strategy, um, or city centre movement strategy, cycling strategies, lots of other strategies which we've been striving to deliver over a large number of years. And I suppose what the COVID-19 pandemic has done for us is it has allowed us to accelerate the implementation of a number of these uh, measures um, significantly faster than we would have done otherwise. So we've been able to put in a short-term mobility plan, which has brought forward a number of the longer-term plans that we have and allowed us to deliver them in a much shorter term. Um, re we've rebranded the city as Reimagining Cork City, as suppose well as the brand that we're using now reimagining the city for a new future. 
So just some of the key principles that we put, we, we put in place when we're looking at evaluating all of the different interventions. Safety, and obviously safety must be the first uh, priority. Uh, we, all of what we did had to meet minimum standards. You couldn't put anything that was substandard in and caused a public safety uh, issue, public danger. Uh, confidence in the city centre was another key uh, deliverable. It's very, very important that people felt confident that they could come back into the city um, and shop and transact business and socialise safely. Um, accessibility was obviously very, very important. Universal design, so that everything we did was fully accessible by anybody with any level of ability. Um, and obviously there was also functional um, requirements. So the city had to function. So it wasn't possible to pedestrianise the entire city centre permanently and constantly 24 seven, because you wouldn't be able to, we don't have uh, any other alternative means of getting goods into shops. Obviously longer term, we're looking at a number of different options, but in the short term, we still need to provide delivery services to uh, city centre shops. Uh, it had to be safe, welcoming and a comfortable environment, um, but equally it needed to be delivered rapidly and quickly. Uh, so there's a lot of tactical urbanism, as you'll see, where we, we put things in very, very quickly, and then we look at making them look prettier uh, in, in the longer term. Um, and obviously we needed to ensure quick wins. There was no point in spending six or 12 months planning this. We needed to plan six or 12 days and start implementing immediately. And this was a, a short term deliverable. And I think we've achieved that. And I suppose the one I'd like to focus on this slide is consultation. And it was very, very important that we undertook consultation that we didn't just go out and make significant changes to the city center without consulting with people. And um, there are implications for lots of different people in what we have done, some good implications, some bad implications. So I suppose we were very, very keen to engage with people. And to do that, we used our consult at CorkCity.ie consultation portal, a very, very important digital tool. It allows us to consult with a lot of people very, very quickly, get back feedback very, very quickly and move forward with implementing our plans. Moving on then to some of the key challenges. Um, so obviously, um, any city like Cork that's 800 years old is going to have challenges in making significant sweeping changes to the city centre. One of the key ones was our historic narrow streets. So obviously we're a medieval city uh, in the old core of the city uh, and trying to, you can see the picture there, a lot of narrow streets and trying to social distance and those is challenging. Um, obviously you've got conflicting demands. You've got cyclists, pedestrians, vehicles, residents, communities, businesses, and they all want something slightly different from the city centre and trying to get consensus was challenging. Um, I've already mentioned the fact that it needs to be responsive and timely con collaboration between the, the various key parties. We couldn't spend six months talking about this. We needed action, but we needed to consult with people as well. As I said, what we've done is in some cases a little bit rough and ready, and in some cases not so much. Uh, you'll see some uh, very nice pictures of some of what we've done, and you'll see some things that we need to modify that we've put in on a short-term basis and we improve them over time. Um, this is obviously a rapidly evolving environment and so we've, we've got to be very, very adaptive and accept that there is going to be changes and then adapt to those changes. And again, communication is very, very important. And again, we use a lot of our social media tools and a lot of our digital platforms for a lot of this communication to get to the widest possible audience as quickly as possible. So there's just a short list and I'll go through each of these in the following slides now of the types of interventions that we've put in place to support the pedestrianization of the city centre. I think we felt that just pedestrianising streets wasn't going to be enough. You need to support that pedestrianisation through, for example, the provision of additional bike parking facilities, extension of street furniture licence and winter proofing of street furniture licences, and improved cycle, or additional cycling structure infrastructure, improved cycling infrastructure, new cycling infrastructure, uh, moss walls, urban parklets, a significant project around greening the city, um, temporary footpath extensions on streets that it's not possible to do anything else. So we've installed a modular footpath extension, which allows us to then reimagine that street in a, in, in a very innovative way. And then a completely new branding initiative. So we felt that you know, some of the signage that we would normally put up saying road closed um, with, with very negative connotations on it. And I suppose what we were saying is not that the road is closed, but we've converted this road into a pedestrian street. And we were, it's got to be friendly and welcoming signage rather than a, a negative brand message. So you'll see some of the, the branding that we've done around that. If you take a look here um, on the uh, left hand image, you will see the red streets are streets that are permanently pedestrianized. All of the green streets are streets that we're extending significantly pedestrian time on in the evening. So it'll be up to 2 a.m. And the brown, the the blue ones are ones we're extending at both directions. It's going to be to 2 a.m. and it's going to be from 9 o'clock in the morning. 
9.30 in the morning. So you can see there's a whole city centre is being completely revamped uh, between Patrick Street and South Mall, and we're significantly extending any existing pedestrianisations that were in place. Over on the other side here, you can see one of these streets. It's, it's uh, this street here. Um, this is uh, Princess Street, and you can see how we've reimagined it with quite a significant um, uh, on-street presence of tables and chairs and the removal of vehicles entirely from that street from half past nine in the morning to, to late in the evenings. Um, this image down here is one of the, uh, what we call the marina in Cork, um, and it is a new pedestrian uh, walkway that we put in, in along the, uh, the waterfront. It's 1.5 kilometers long, and it is extremely popular at weekends for recreation in the evenings. You can see it's down by Parky Quay, one of our national GA stadiums in the Atlantic Pond. There's a public walkway down towards Rochestown. It's linked into the city up here. So it's a, it's a wonderful amenity that you know, shows something that's not just pedestrianization of traffic streets, but also looking at um, other interventions. Moving on then to bike parking. So this is Union Quay here. You can see where this black top here is. That was parking up at the start of COVID. So we installed a rubberized curb and we infilled the parking area. And we've now created a space behind where the footpath was that can be used for tables and chairs and street furniture. The people can now walk where the cars used to park. And we've taken the opportunity to insert bike parking at the end to create additional bike parking. This is an example up here where clearly uh, these bottles were only just put in when this photograph was taken. So you can clearly see there's a need identified at this location where people are attaching their bikes to just general signs or anything they can attach them to. So now we've, we've installed a number of bike stands here to uh, address an existing need. And again, over here, you can see there's a number of poles. This was kind of a, a, an area that was underutilized on our main street, Patrick Street. So what we have done is we have put in additional facilities there where there's space that wasn't being utilized for anything else. Moving on to, I suppose, winterproofing some of our streets. And um, these are some of the streets, these examples here, these four are streets that we've pedestrianized. So this is Pembroke Street. So you can see it's being pedestrianized. And some of the businesses have then put out, um, whether it be uh, canopies in this particular um, instance. And um, again, here you can see, this is Tucky Street, which is being pedestrianized. This is an example here of the tactical urbanism I'm talking about. So it's a standard road closure sign, and you can see we put our, our branding onto it. Ultimately, that would be replaced with proper retractable bollards that would allow us to automatically control the access and exit into that street. Again, this is a very, very nice example. This is Little Ann Street uh, off Washington Street, whereby in conjunction with the local business, uh, we have, you know, there's been a, a grass carpet laid on what used to be the, the blacktop paving, um, and there's been a very nice winterproofed set of tables and chairs put in there, which will allow that business to flourish and all the local businesses in that area. Again, this is a Maribyrnong Street, another example of us having closed the street in the city centre uh, and being utilised quite extensively for um, tables and chairs. This is a uh, further down the other, earlier image I showed you uh, where we put in, installed the additional footpath where there was a uh, parking previously, and that has left quite an extensive area, as you can see, for winterproof tables and chairs for outside dining into the winter. And again, this is just a slightly different example, whereby somebody already has an awning at the front of their building. So what they will do is they'll replace these low barriers with barriers that are perspex in the top half, and that will allow this whole area to be winterproofed going forward. So into the winter, we would expect there to be significant on-street dining across city, um, which is something unique and different, something that we haven't had in the past. I know in a European context, this is nothing new, but I can guarantee you in Cork, sitting out in the rain in the winter, eating outdoors is something that we don't normally do, but it's something we're really looking forward to this winter. In, in relation to cycling infrastructure, we have got a significant uh, project around installing bollards along some of our existing cycle infrastructure. There'll be uh, four and a half kilometers of cycle bollards installed. We're also installing brand new cycling infrastructure. So if you take a look here, this is the south side of South Mall in the city center. Um, we will be installing cycle lane along here, two-way cycle lane. And as you can see, that's directly adjacent to all the streets that we're pedestrianizing. So there's a linkage between the improved cycling infrastructure and some of the pedestrianization. Again, up here, this is uh, Horgan's Key. We're going to be removing part of the, the lanes here and installing again a two-way cycle lane along here. And that, all that work has commenced. And again, obviously, we're going to be spending money upgrading a lot of the um, uh, existing um, infrastructure for cycling that we have around the city. Here are some of maybe some of the more innovative one, uh, uh, interventions that we're looking at. 
Over here, you have the, uh, from an air quality perspective, we're installing some city trees, some moss walls, uh, which will uh, look to address some of the particulate matter issues around the city from a pollution perspective. So air is sucked in and blown out over the moss, and that uh, removes the elements of the particulate matter from it, which is digested by the moss. So we're looking forward to those being in place by the start of November. Uh, here's some of the floral decoration planters that we have put in around the city to try and brighten up the pedestrianized streets. Because as you can see, it's just a standard tarmac street. Um, and again, this intervention here, there's a number of those on, on Pembroke, Princess Street is this example, which really, really improved the street look and feel. And again, this is an example of some of the parklets that we're putting in around the city. This is the one we put in last year in Douglas Street as a trial. And we've been able to use the um, COVID uh, pandemic as uh, a catalyst to put 10 more of these across the, the city as well. And you can see you've got, you've got seating areas, but you're, you're sitting in a very, very um, nice environment within the middle of, uh, of the city. Again, this is a, another unique example of, of a different street, something we were struggling to try and to del deliver something on McCartan Street because it was quite a, a different street to a lot of the others. So you can see what we've done here is we've installed these, I call them large Lego blocks, but they're a modular paving extension uh, with a ramp onto the old pavement and you build it out. So this is what it looks like when it's built out. And again, people can traverse from the old footpath to the new footpath. It gives more social distancing space. Or as in these two examples, what it allows us to do here is uh, give over the old footpath to on-street dining and people can use the new footpath that we've built. Again, this is another example. This is all the old footpath that would not have been available to that premises for outdoor dining had we not built the temporary modular footpath outside it. So again, just coming up to the last slide now, this is an example of some of the rebranding that we've done. So again, you saw this put on our A-frame. So again, it's about enjoying our people-friendly street rather than saying that the street is closed. It's a, it's a different message, it's a positive. And so these four rectangular ones are all of signs that we've put around the city. And these circular ones here are stickers. They're about 300 millimeters in diameter. Each of them have been put onto, there's a large number that we put around the city center uh, as stickers on the actual ground. So it's made a, a big difference. It's a very positive message while getting across the importance of the removal of cars from certain streets uh, across the city center. And thank you very much for your time and attention. That's great. Thank you very much, David. Um, now we're coming to the Q&A section. So just don't forget, if you have a Q uh, questions for any of our panelists or speakers today, you can just let us know in the comment section below on Zoom. Uh, and don't forget that the hashtag, if you want to share any, any thoughts on the panels on social media, is hashtag AISCF20. So uh, we do have some questions, first of all, for both Roberta and David. I think, Roberta, there's a question here for you from Paul, I, I believe it was during your talk, uh, for, from Paul Scott. It says, what makes a data lake a smart data lake? <laughs> OK. Uh, when we began our uh, job uh, at, the, at the beginning of the mandate, I, I made an assessment of uh, how many databases we had, how was the perception of data, and it was, uh, the situation was very bad. We had more than two, 284 different databases uh, which were built not to speak each other. So uh, privacy and the security was the LIB to protect the data. So we began this journey. Uh, we have not finished yet. So we are in, in the middle of our journey. Uh, we call, data lake is when we put all together our data and we begin to work on it. I call smart lake. I'm not sure this is the right uh, term, but I call smart lake uh, when we have data that we can use to be interoperable. So to work together, for example, for the citizen digital folder, people uh, call for a certificate on their mobile phones and that maybe the data comes from different sources and uh, it's uh, the app works in order to get the data from different sources and uh, prepare the certificate. So it is always up to date. We are in the middle of the journey, so maybe 60% of our data are already in a smart lake, but uh, the journey is still long. 
Hi, right, David, there's a question here for you from Hannah DW, uh, who is asking, was low carbon a key principle of reimagining Cork? Yes, obviously, as I said, all of our long term plans look at um, reducing carbon within the, the, the city. And um, so we looked at any intervention that we could undertake and um, that would reduce carbon and obviously looking at removing vehicles from the, the carriageways, replacing them with cycling, walking, replacing them with more sustainable modes of transport was a key determination in, in identifying some of the interventions that we've implemented. Okay, great. Uh, and then we have a question from Udrun Reid of TU Dublin, who is addressing both you, David, and Roberta. Uh, what has been the reaction to the changes that you've implemented? Uh, are people looking to keep them? And is there anyone against them? Are you having much uh, negative feedback? I think is what they're they're asking. For, he's asking. So maybe we can start with you, David, just because you're. Yeah. Um. So I suppose that's why I mentioned earlier our consult.ie our consult our corkcity.ie portal. We were very very clear. We wanted to go and consult before we made any of these changes, but we used technology to speed up that consultation process because during all of the consultation processes we identified issues that we had to iron out before we implemented the changes. So we may have had an idea to implement 15 items within a change, but when we went back and spoke to members of the public, spoke to businesses, spoke to communities within the city, 10 of those might have been implemented and we may have amended the other five because of the feedback that we received. So because we did do the initial consultation, because we engaged people early in the process and used their feedback to modify what we implemented, We've gotten massive support across the city for what we've actually done. And Roberta, the same question to you. I, I totally agree with David. We had the, the same reaction. Uh, uh, please consider that uh, even in Milan, which is the most technological and advanced city in Italy, we still have a huge uh, uh, digital gap. So at the very beginning, when we uh, suggested all these changes uh, through digital people were suspicious uh, they you know they, they didn't trust a lot but when we offer them the value of the project uh, so they they changed their mind and I am very proud of the percentage of people downloading themselves their own certificates and documents because this is a good example of how people month after month and year after year because this work was prepared in advance uh, we, we can say that now we gain trust, but we have to keep it. And so we also uh, have to work on digital education, not only on technological development, because we really have to engage um, as many people as possible. Okay. And um, David, there's another question from, for you from, from Kenny. Uh, how do you deal with objections and regulations when trying to swiftly deliver change like what you've evidenced in Cork and um, reference in other areas uh, are buried in divergent opinion and objections in trying to deliver change? So how do you deal with objections uh, and regulations? Again, taking them separately, objections. Obviously, as I said, we did get an awful lot of feedback in relation to the proposals that we made to change Cork City. But again, the best way to deal with objections is sit down with the objectors identify what their specific issues are and see what can be, you know, what, what implementations or what changes can be made to the implementation to address their specific issues. And that's what we did. We actually directly contacted people who had made submissions and who had raised specific points in relation to some of the interventions that we were putting in place and tried to understand where they were coming from and work with them. So, for example, it might have been a case of them changing their delivery schedule. So instead of the delivery schedule normally happening at one o'clock in the day, if we were now closing that street at 9.30 in the morning, working with them and their logistics delivery uh, organizations to get their deliveries in earlier in the morning since they had those deliveries. And um, so it was very much around that. And I think a lot of people use regulations and legislation as an excuse sometimes. I think um, while we did nothing illegally, and obviously we wouldn't do anything illegally, there are ways that you can expedite the processes. So, for example, we used a temporary street closure under, sex, uh, under the Irish road traffic legislation to close the roads very, very quickly. 
but we've then gone through a section 38 under the road traffic legislation to permanently close those roads. So we undertook within the confines of the legislation, a temporary closure initially with the view then to putting in place permanent closures in the longer term, rather than just waiting for the longer term processes. So we use the legislation that is available to us to our advantage. Okay, great. And uh, David, you're, you're a popular man. This, this uh, presentation, there's another question from Union Quinn. Uh, who asked, what plans are being made for the post-COVID situation in Cork streets? Um, is there a clear consensus for the reimagining of the city centre? So again, a lot of, as I was saying earlier, when, when, on my first context slide, you'll see that an awful lot of what we're doing under our COVID plan is what we have planned to do in the longer term anyway. So it's part of our CMATS or our CCMS or our city development plan. So it is really taking uh, concepts that you know, are accepted for the city and accelerating the delivery of as many of them as we possibly can. Uh, and again, it is going to be a, a sea change for Cork City. I mean, we are looking further down the line at, um, as I said, looking at city centre living, looking at a city of neighbourhoods, looking at how we can develop some of these concepts. The one thing that COVID has driven home to us as a city is the importance of having people living in the city centre and not having a donut of a city where people live outside and only commute into the city centre. So going forward, Cork City would very much encouraging people to be moving into the city centre, living over the shop type of initiatives and other initiatives so that we do have vibrant communities within our city. Okay, great. And uh, Roberto, there's a question here from Giorgio Prister, uh, who asks, how does Milan manage the digital IDs? Um, like this? Okay, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I was quite lucky because when I began my role here, there was the first uh, um, personal identification card with a chip. And so we began, as Milan was the first city, to uh, distribute uh, ID card with a chip inside. From that moment, we have worked with the government in order to make that chip useful for people. Because again, you can't uh, uh, gain trust if you do not offer value to people. So it was totally useless to have a card with a chip if there is nothing on that chip. Uh, unfortunately, uh, many of our laws were against us because uh, here again, in Italy, there are a lot of documents who should be uh, signed uh, by person. So we work with the government year after year. And the, something I want to mention is that uh, one of my key projects is the digital bridges. We set up many digital bridges with international cities to work on uh, um, similar topics. And one was with Tallinn. Tallinn is probably the capital of uh, digital identity. So I took their example to our city, to our government, and we worked. After four years, I can say that we now have uh, a government uh, uh, identification system. And so we are distributing these also in our registry offices. And so we are moving part of the content of our website uh, only uh, achievable through, through this uh, digital ID. This is just the beginning because we have uh, a lot of population who are still out of this experience. But here again, we have to work also with digital education. Okay, great. And I'd say we probably have time for one more question. Uh, again, Roberta, we have um, a question from Paul Scott, who's kind of looking at the, the privacy side of let's say a lot of the questions regarding data and COVID-19, they're asking whether uh, sensitive data is collected and used in any way to promote uh, personalization or usability in, in, in Milan. Okay, uh, speaking of data, we should have a lot of time because there are many different perspectives. One of the key points that we had to face were privacy. So when we speak about data, people come back and say, no, 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 I don't give you my data. I have to say that with the, the pandemic, people understood that the data were used to help them, to help them on health, which is, uh, you know, a key point. And so they have to balance privacy or what they thought about privacy and uh, their personal security, so health. So we worked in order to, you know, we are the municipality of Milan, so we already have uh, 
all data of citizen. I have, I am uh, in, in charge of, of the registry office, so I have all the, the, the information. What we have, we were very, um, uh, we, we paid a lot of attention to use data always in order to offer a value to people. And these uh, opened a lot of words. Personalization was made through the app. So one, uh, I, I mentioned that we moved the, the digital citizen folder on an app instead of going to the website. Uh, I am so sorry that you couldn't see my slide, but I'll send you. So if you want to share, please do. And uh, uh, using the app from uh, a personal mobile phone makes possible to see, for example, shops around the, the person, the, reg the, the, the closest registry office, the pharmacy, uh, which is the closest number to call for some help. And so we want to uh, use the interoperability of data to make this experience very personalized, customized. Great. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Roberta, and thank you very much, David, for taking the time to share your thoughts and on your cities and, and letting us know what exactly is happening with COVID-19 there. So we're now moving into the second session, um, which is, we'll discuss how tourism can be transformed in response to COVID-19. So it's no secret that the air travel industry has been decimated by the pandemic with holidaymakers cancelling plans to travel abroad. Uh, however, in this place, vacation has really come into its own and has given citizens a new glimpse of their own countries. Uh, but travel restrictions and other factors such as climate change have pushed tourism beyond, uh, forwards to be agile and innovative uh, now and in the years to come. So now we'll hear from two innovator, innovators who have been working to future-proof um, tourism, both offline and online. Um, our first speaker is Yvonne Rossenstatter, Head of Marketing and Market Management for Benelux, Romanesque Markets and UK for Salisbury Gland Tourismus in, Aust in Austria. Uh, her career in the tourism industry has, in has included positions in marketing with Austria's largest airline and as a cluster director of sales at Wyndham Worldwide with over 8,000 hotels. Since 2018, she's been responsible for the international market management at Salisbury Gland Tourism. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Yvonne to present her presentation. Yes, hello. Good afternoon, everyone. So um, my name is Yvonne Rosenstatter, and I'm in charge for the marketing and market management for the Salzburg Land Tourism Board. Today, my presentation is about the challenges of COVID-19, which brought, was brought to our company due to the COVID challenges. So look at these pictures. You might know them all, but for Austria, we have at the moment a GDP decrease um, with minus 7.5% predicted. And we are all very serious about these numbers. So we, we, we just think what we can do and what might be the best step from our side of the tourism. The tourism numbers, just to start for a small, small, short overview, in 2019, we had 29.8 million overnight stays in Salzburg, um, and we had 8.1 million arrivals. Approximately 4 billion euros came directly or indirectly from the value from overnight tourism. Overnight tourism does not include um, the city tourism. The ratio summer winter is 45 to 55%. So we have further 34% of five to five stars categories in the hotels. We offer our guests 5,500 hotels and approximately 216,000 beds. So as you might imagine, um, approximately 50,000 employees in the whole area of Salzburg and Salzburger Land are working in the tourism in the tourism industry. So what happened? On the 16th of March, um, the lockdown came. Within a few days, we had, to, we had to close all our hotels. And even we, within our office, we had to go, stay at home, work at home office, and work short time. We, we had to cancel all our planned spring and summer campaigns even the cancellation of our planned PR events and press events. So from one day to another, we found ourselves in different roles. For example, I had to work at the COVID-19 hotline from the 
government for two months and it was really a very interesting job because you never imagine what ha happens to families, to, uh, to companies. If you are in a lockdown, you are not allowed to go cross border. You are not allowed to travel or even to visit your, your families. Just um, to show you um, our slide, till the end of February, we had a, a, um, a tourist, tourist growth of 8.4% in the Salzburg land area. Then the lockdown came, we had in the first month already a minus of 56.2%. So we ask ourselves, what can we do, you, do to use the current challenges to develop ourselves and even to develop our organizational structure. We defined a sprint guide dedicated which resources were left and on which resources we should focus on. We defined that for us the customer focusation is very important. We um, said we want still to be continue, uh, we work on our continual improvement and we want to work due to short time and due to home office in a time box and self-organizing way. Um, for us, we defined, we have some questions. First of all, how do we po position now ourselves? We said we want to clear and transparent with all our messages to guests to add, aid their decisions. We, our main four focus points were um, be regional, be sustainable, give the guests which will come again, high-end service level, and always inform very open about all COVID-19 safety standards which were taken. Um, further, we have to redefine ourselves with our market and marketing ideas because normally we focus on print, radio, TV, TV and social media and marketing online marketing activities but due to this new to these new challenges we decided to be more social media active on at the first time and to set more mar online marketing acti activities our main focus in the first steps was the home markets and the closed markets markets such as germany switzerland and the czech republic then we decided again to strengthen Father, our cooperation with national and international transport providers to be more sustainable. Um, we also want to be visible on all the other markets, world, international and worldwide, um, but with a responsible amount of money. Because the budget situation in the background is that since our budgets consist of public funding supported by city tax, and we have to completely set up a new budget and we went to our regions and asked them to support us and together we put up a big very helpful budget to make a restart campaign so here you see how our restart campaign looked like we had four phases it was an information phase inspiration motivation and multiplication at the moment at first, we made a kind of information. We, we made some films. Everything was very informational for the uh, uh, B2B clients and even for the B2C clients. In our second phase, the inspirational phase, where we looked for reach, awareness, and visibility, um, we started with our restart campaign, firstly on the domestic, then on the European markets. Um, and the phase three in which we are at at the moment, we try to, to get to our final clients with motivation. We are doing so, so, um, um, this with customer activation and a lot of performance marketing. On this slide, I can show you our, how our film, the first film we, we broadcasted in TV looked like it was at the end of April. Das erste Mal wieder an Urlaub denken. OK, 
Okay, and then in the second phase, we started with our motivation. We started mo with motivation images, and on these images, it, it was told such as, um, now that's how to wash your hands in 20 seconds. That's how to go step by step, step back to normality. And then we started in the next step with the motivation phase, even on our international markets. And then we had uh, inspirational pictures and very personal pictures such, such as now that's an autumn holiday or now that's how a good sunrise is. As a best practice example, I brought to you our virtual press trip. Um, we did before some virtual press trip, but this press trip on the 8th of September was different because we had 73 international uh, journalists from Germany and Austria taking part. And we brought to them Salzburgerland. We sent to each individual journalist a, a small box with um, some goodies from Salzburgerland, even with a very good lunch. And during this time, in this, um, this press event, which took about, take about tw two hours, um, they were able to visit four regions. And in all four regions, we have a live live broadcasting with different themes of Salzburgerland. For example, we had the Baroque city of Salzburg. We had um, making yoga and relaxing on the top of a mountain in the region of St. Johann. Then we had um, the preview on the UCI World Cup in Salfelden Leogang. And even at the end, we had um, a, a, a typical lakes and mountains theme with, um, with the famous Hotel Fuschel. So, and this kind of press trip, I think, might be for the future more and more important because it's the way how you reach your journalist, how you reach your audience in a simple way. And as at the moment, we, we don't want to make press trips direct because even the COVID-19 is everywhere present and it's very uh, very effort, affording at the moment and hard to organize something. We decided to do all our press events, such as tomorrow we have an, an UK press event uh, online with testimonials, with live broadcasting, so that we are close at our journalists, but even close, not so close to them that there might be any problem. Two minutes, Yvonne. Yes. So preparing for the winter season, preparing for the winter season, we have um, a very, we, we come out with a very consumer friendly pricing. We have a open COVID-19 information policy. Our hospitality staff is tested weekly, free of charge. So we have at the moment um, 5,500 um, staff members going to tests. Even they can, more can go, but it's up to themselves. We have very clear safety regulations, already guidelines for ski shows, for hotels and up risky. Um, so what there are learnings for the last six months? We have to be continuous agile, never take anything as proven, be flexible on the market and building more consumer confidence. Further apply to those values with which have gained now more importance and our campaigns must, more, must become more flexible. Important values for us for tourism, we defined five main values with this, which are, these are togetherness, slowing down and mindfulness, safety and trust, a longing for nature and regionality and rediscovery. And finally, I will show you our, our newest brand new video for the winter season. Dear winter, you warm my heart. You make my eyes light up and get my pulse racing to sunny new heights. See you soon. Winter approaches in Salzburgerland. So thanks for your attention. Great. Thank you very much, Yvonne. And uh, just as a reminder that um, if you want to ask Yvonne any questions on the talk she just gave, please do let us know in the Q&A below. Uh, so we are now going to the second speaker for this session. Um, we have Dave Vincent, who is the Chief Digital Officer with Tourism Northern Ireland. 
In his role, Dave is responsible for accelerating a digital first ambition to deliver organizational change while also providing strategic digital leadership to the tourism industry to enhance the visitor experience. So as he explained, digital transformation is no longer the golden ticket, but is now the thing which enables the business. So now let me hand you over to Dave. Thank you very much, Colin, um, and good afternoon, everyone, and, and many thanks for the opportunity to share a little bit of our, our story with you. Um, Colin has deliberately poked me there by, by mentioning a swear word in, in, in my language, which is digital transformation. Um, and my title deliberately talks about digitally enabling a response to, to the current situations. So I'm going to tell you a little bit of a story and ask for some um, poetic license to tell you the journey that we're on. We've already heard from a number of speakers that they certainly don't have everything cracked, but we're on a journey um, which is actually um, fairly similar to, to some of the other speakers. And we've heard terms like agile. Um, when I pick up the conference agenda and look at things like reimagining, responsive, um, reinventing, uh, resilient and disruptive, all things that could be associated with a, a digitally enabled response. But I guess my, my, my story that I'm going to tell you starts a little bit before the COVID, the current COVID response. Um, it takes it on board, but I wanted to set in context how Tourism Northern Ireland and our industry are looking at responding to, to the current um, environmental, social and economic challenges that are around, as well as the health ones. So, so if we kind of start with the story, um, tourism in Northern Ireland has been historically very underinvested, but has been on something of a, of a growth journey over the last 10 years, peaking last year with my own personal highlight of the Open up in, up in Royal Portrush. Um, but lots of iconic events, lots of investment, and lots of investment in technology-led um, um, experiences, attractions, and capability, um, and something that was going really well with a, a draft tourism strategy that was talking all about doubling the size of our industry, currently about a billion pounds in, in revenue, um, not counting overnight stays, um, doubling the number of people employed from 65,000 to about 130,000 people in the next 10 years. So, so a fairly ambitious strategy, which is there and it is sitting on the shelf. But in a world where um, the world is changing and it's changing fast, I, I think you have to be hiding under a rock not to understand that, that people's opinions are changing. The world is evolving very quickly. Um, the sharing and, and the evolving of messaging happens very quickly. And there's a real focus um, on ecotourism, on sustainability. And I'm not going to dwell on that because I'm not an expert, but that's one of the themes that's coming along. Um, in our own little country, um, we were becoming successful. Um, the, 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 the sector was growing. We were seeing increased visitor numbers, but around a number of our really well-known hotspots. And actually, we were getting very successful in getting people to move about, to the, come to the country to spend money. But the experience when they arrived there was a bit underwhelming and impacted by the fact that actually um, there were too many people there. So, so a real kind of a agenda there for us to look at how we make people move about regionally, but also that we improve their experience when we're there. And then February, March time, um, this little beast arrived and changed everything um, and changed what we were thinking, changed our strategy and changed the focus of our, our, ourselves as an organization. Um, and, and I use the term when, when we mobilized and sent everybody home that never has, has there been a more important time for to Northern Ireland to be serving the needs of our industry, but also of our, our visitors. Um, and on that note, um, just, just to give you our first digital intervention, and just to give you a sense of the scale of the impact, I've talked about 65,000 jobs across tourism and hospitality in Northern Ireland. This was an economic model um, done by, the, by my digital team uh, back in May time that tried to give us a sense of the potential scenarios and potential outcomes that the, the COVID um, pandemic was having on our industry. It had three, it had a best case, a worst case, and, and, and a likely case um, that looked at the potential impact on economic activity and the potential impact on jobs using lots of different data sources, um, procured data sources, some of our own, and some modeling from, our, from around the world. Um, we're currently revising that, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to say that we're beyond the worst case, and, and this just this week we'll publish a new model which will look worse than scenario three and, and, and more than likely to happen based on the current state of the pandemic and our response to that and the current government response in terms of lockdowns and, and restrictions that are there and the on-off nature of that with health absolutely rightly being, being the focus, but a real challenge for us as an organization to balance that health message with keeping our industry open, uh, supporting them from a financial perspective, but also paying heed to public safety and making sure that, that our advertising campaigns heed that. And you've already seen from previous speakers how, how the balance of that is a difficult thing to achieve, but is, is possible. Um, and at the same time, all of that is impacting the end visitor in terms of what they expect from us, their expectation before they come, the information that they're expecting to get, um, the experience they're, they're expecting to see when they get here. So it's a really changing world 
certainly one that is very digitally focused um, and one certainly before they come that they expect to be able to get access to everything, whether that's just seeing images, booking stuff via Instagram, being able to book tickets, book accommodation and um, without actually having to talk to people. Now that's an interesting thing um, because certainly in, in the north of the country um, throughout the pandemic, we have seen an absolute rapid increase in the, um, in the, the, in the world where our visitors want to speak to actual hoteliers or accommodation providers rather than just booking online. They may well book online having spoke to someone, but it's been an interesting pivot in, in the way that we've seen uh, the market change. So we're having to respond even quicker to all of the things that I've talked about, the pandemic, the, the evolving requirements of the user um, and, and, and the changing world. Um, and a focus that we have and, and a, word, a, a word that we use to describe it now is regenerative tourism, really looking to drive our impact on um, the visitor, on the economy but also on the local communities and make it much more sustainable. A real drive to, to make the tourism ecosystem look at social drivers, environmental drivers and economic drivers together rather than being in silos. And really using digital and technology in the right way um, to make sure that we, we can do storytelling, we can, we can develop experiences and we can also build um, right now today a safer visitor interaction. So lots going on. And um, what, what I want to talk to you about is just from our perspective, the digital priorities that, that we have set and have been there for the last two or three years and are actually still valid in the world that we live in today very much about developing resilience of my own organization and our ability to respond quicker, but also the resilience and competitiveness and, and efficiency of, of my industry, whether that be just making sure they're bookable online, uh, whether their content is good to go on whatever platform is there, or actually right now today, how well are they using just good old fashioned IT to make their business more effective and to, to start driving savings and efficiencies. Um, we have a role there and my job description is all around innovation and providing thought leadership to the organization but also to the industry and I'll give you some examples um, and, and like previous speakers a huge focus on data, data, data but not just for the sake of data. Um, I talk about um, a, a, a digital landfill, lots of data being created and, and the question I keep asking my own team is so what, what are we actually using it for, is it just to run the reports we've always run before or is it actually to inform and drive business decision making and outcomes. So let me give you a couple of examples. Conscious we've only got a short period of time and I'm happy to take some questions on this. Um, in terms of digitally reimagining experiences and re-providing visitor information in a different way, lots of examples here on screen, working with local technology companies in partnerships with our tourism providers and our council stakeholders to reimagine things using augmented reality and immersive technologies. Um, telling stories in a different way, using different technologies to engage with our users. Um, down the bottom is a, is a little igloo, which is actually addressing accessibility challenges on the Giants Causeway. How do we allow people who can't make it to our actual experience to still have some sort of experience when they arrive there? Through to telling stories in different ways, to doing itinerary planning and, and building digital maps, through to our new visitor center up in the Northwest in Derry, which is, is, is probably the leading digital experience in the country at the moment, as it's just opened its doors. Everything from digital visitor passes to interactive maps, um, really just trying to think about different ways of using the technology, but actually turning that on its head, applying some, some digital technologies and methodologies around design thinking and trying to place our customer and our visitor back at the center of it. I talk about digital and the case of the disappearing chief digital officer. I want my role to be in the background. I want to be delivering business outcomes as opposed to being the answer with the latest, greatest piece of product that the industry is looking for a home for. We're really trying to mature our industry to think about what is the outcome, what is the experience we're trying to deliver that digital, digitally we can enable. Um, and, and you'll hear that as a theme as I go through. Um, the real passion for me is around intelligent tourism, so understanding where our visitors are. Um, I talked about the hotspotting earlier on where we've got lots of people turning up at the same small number of destinations. How do we understand where they are? How do we understand some demographics about them? How do we understand their economic impact? And if we understand all of that, then we have a chance of impacting their behavior and getting them to move about and, and, and to move to the places that we want them to move. But also from that perspective, if I understand more about my industry and the actual um, data that they have, how do I start to inform my own policy making? How do I make smarter decisions? From a COVID perspective, how do we make sure that we're providing support in the right reasons? Um, the COVID economic response in Northern Ireland and from Northern Ireland government has been fairly comprehensive, but there have people, there have been people in who have fallen through the cracks. And we have used data to understand who those people are and why they're falling through and not applicable to apply and not applicable for those um, pieces of support. And, and those are now coming to the table in terms of new programs coming from government to support those. People like um, 
B&B operators who don't have a, a rateable property, a business rateable property, and therefore didn't meet the criteria, or the coach and tour operators who don't necessarily fall directly into tourism, but weren't able to access direct um, support from government. So working with our, our partners to, to drive um, data-driven um, recommendations through to the highest level of government to make sure that decisions are made. Um, and again, this, this screen just tries to give you a sense of, of something that we're developing called the Tourism and I Data Hub. Um, it's deliberately small, so that you can't see the numbers because that's where everybody goes when I present this. Um, but there are a couple of elements to this. Um, one is it's data that we, yeah, okay. One of this is uh, data that we've created ourselves. One is data that we're putting out. So we have IoT networks and we have sensors around places like London Dairy and, and the walls or the Morn Mountains. We have credit card spending data that we're buying. And then we have engagement with the industry where they're helping us model uh, the economic impact of the COVID um, pandemic. And the top two slides are really about that, where we're identifying indicators that we can measure on a weekly and monthly basis that allow us to understand the impact of this pandemic and any other a wave or any other issue that comes along. But again, trying to make this much more self-service that our industry can log in and use this, share their data and become part of the journey. And that's all great and we're showing the way. So from a digital perspective and just in closing as, as a final slide, what are we actually trying to enable and, and do differently? And I've alluded to it as I go through. We're trying to get our industry and my own organization to become much more focused on business outcomes. Colin said at the start that digital isn't the golden ticket anymore. It is, but it's an enabler. And we have to focus on what the business outcomes are. I need to use that to develop resilience within my own organization, within the people in my organization, but also within my own industry, getting to use the technology and tools that are there or investing in regional and standardized um, platforms that will help them. Um, we need to develop the capability. And again, we've heard that from previous speakers about developing that digital mindset. Um, and embedding it in my own organization, but across the industry, um, and not just in the big players, but across every, every one of our companies and our businesses that are there. We should develop this agile mindset in terms of breaking things down into smaller components and driving those, piloting those, working with, with technology providers and our industry to, to pilot and, and fail fast is, a, is another piece of terminology we use, or plan without constraints. See if we can really reimagine what we're trying to do, do it in small things, chunk it up, and then test and look to roll it out wider. And my real passion is around data-driven decision-making, using data to actually tell stories in a different way and developing data literacy among um, the key stakeholders and across our organization, helping them to make data-driven decisions. Thank you very much. Great, thanks, thanks, Dave. That was uh, interesting and apologies for saying the uh, a bad, <laughs> a bad word in the data-driven world. <laughs> Um, now, just a reminder again, that, uh, if you have any questions at all for Dave or Yvonne, just let us know on the Q&A panel below. Uh, but we do have some questions uh, to kick us off anyway. It'd be great to get some more. So uh, the first question is to Yvonne. Um, we have Audrin Reid again from TU Dublin asking, uh, how long will it be before you can get back to sus sustainable tourist, tourism industry? Um, have we changed fundamentally the type of tourist offering we now have? And are we looking to have more quality rather than quantity. Yes, we already started, already started to be more sustainable already some years ago, for example. As uh, two years ago, we had this big discussion about over tourism. And already during this time, we decided to put to create our campaigns more quality than quantity focus. So, for example, I just want to mention two points. In Salzburger Land, we have 52% of ecological agriculture. So we have the highest numbers in Europe with agricultural bioculture. And the next thing is, for example, uh, we have one sustainable, a lot of sustainable resource, but one resource I want to mention, it's Werfenweng. When you're going there as a, as a tourist, you give your car when you enter the village. And for this, if you give them your key, the key of your car, and during your, the week you're, you're staying at Werfenweng, you have a lot of uh, you get a, a, a tourist card and you get a lot of uh, benefits if you're not using your car and if you want to visit Salzburg you get an e-car so we have a lot of sustainable campaigns and even offers to our tourists that we are coming more and more sustainable sure it's a it's a hard way as our, as we have over two, two million passengers every year flying into Salzburg but we try to 
to support all sustainable um, travel methods. We have, for example, last year for the first time, we have a direct train from London to Salzburg. We now have direct trains, night trains from Amsterdam, from Copenhagen, from all from all over Europe, from, from Milano, everywhere. So we are working straight together, together with all the railway companies to be more and more sustainable. Well, there's, there's one question from Fintan, um, okay. who is asking a very specific question, but what type of sensors are you using in Erie and at the Moran Mountains? Okay, um, we've actually got a range of sensors up there and we're trialing lots of technology, um, but they're based on the LoRaWAN network, um, so IoT sensors, um, and they're, they're typically beam counters, um, but also looking at uh, telecoms, mobile technology, and small small cells as well. Uh, there's a few more questions here for you, Dave. Anyway, uh, how are you using data to drive experiences to maximize investment and spend in Northern Ireland as opposed to exporting revenue raised abroad? That's from... Uh, person going by the name of Sockatim, S-O-C-I-T-M. Okay, I, I guess it would take much more longer to talk about this one. Um, there's a couple of sides to that. One is creating experiences of scale and of impact in Northern Ireland and using technology to do that. And some of the immersive technology we've shown you does that. The second one is about understanding our visitor and the demographics and how we create experiences and direct them to, to experiences that they would be interested in. Um, but but the answer is, is, is really we're at the start of the journey trying to understand that and push people to experiences. I think the pandemic and the current situation has encouraged people in Northern Ireland to understand um, that when they go on holiday here, they have to spend some money um, and they will get an experience for that. And that's, a, that's an evolution that, that, that hasn't been the same as if we go on holiday to Europe, we're quite happy to spend money to go to an attraction. But here in Northern Ireland, we very typically think that things should be low cost or free. Um, so an evolving, uh, an evolving um, situation. Okay. Uh, again, Dave, you're Man, this yeah. Q and A. The um, from Ryan Johnson, who's asking yeah. uh, the dashboard data setup. Is it currently able to track the carbon emissions in the Northern Irish tourist sector, or are there plans to add that in the future? There are there are plans to add lots of things. We don't have actually the data, so part of the challenge that we've got is sourcing the data first. The dashboard will allow us to put whatever we want on there. Um, I guess just to, to answer it more specifically, one of the things we're doing in the Morn Mountains is we're actually also using Earth observation data. So we we understand how many people are on the path. Um, we fund some of our partners to maintain those paths, but Earth observation data is allowing us to show the wear and tear of those paths and start to model how we move people around the mountain paths. Um, so not a direct answer, Ryan, apologies. Um, the answer is yes, we have an ambition. Part of the challenge is, is finding a standard and consistent way to measure and capture that data from multiple stakeholders. And that's the same for all of the data sets we're talking about. Okay, and uh, please do keep your questions coming in. We've we've had a few, so it'd be great to have some more. Uh, I guess, personally, Yvonne, I'd be interested to hear, um, you have done a, like a video campaign or especially working with journalists to try and promote Salzburg land. Um, I mean, what has been the response from these journalists uh, to this, this real, you know, especially tourism journalists who might have, are more used to traveling abroad. How, how have they responded to the new initiatives that you've helped develop? They responded very positive because it's a new, it's a new way to experience a country. Um, it's not the way a classical travel writer expects because normally he wants to feel and see and taste the country. But in circumstances, it was a um, it was the time that we are we still want don't uh, we still want to that they write something about us because the the main reason why we the, we, we for, uh, we are so close to our journalists is um, that, that we get editorials, that we are everywhere present. And I think it's the way to show them that we even respect their situation at the moment. And I think we, we also did um, in Copenhagen last week a cooking class with journalists. So we have one live cooking chef in Salzburg. We sent to the journalists all the stuff they needed for the Kaiserschmarrn and for the bread. And together they, they had a cooking class. And during the, the times when something was cooking or in the oven, we, 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 talk, we talked about the new things which are happening in Salzburg. Land. And I think these are new ways, ways we can use. But in the future, we have to focus, I think, on both ways, even welcoming the journalists back again here in Salzburg, but even do more and more virtual um, press events and even client events. Mm. 
And has there been any, um, like, is there any things that are very specific to Salzburger land that may not be uh, applicable in another country? I mean, have you, are there very specific things that you have uh, helped innovate that maybe you could potentially share with uh, other people in your sector? Um, one thing we are very proud is that the, our, uh, our state board of tourism is um, very close to culinary themes and we are working very strong together with our farmer industry. So that means that we, we say regional or eco, ecological farming is not only a USP or a selling, a, a selling claim, it's really one hand in another because we, we try to develop a product line which is called Salzburger Land products. For example, if you have a, a cheese, the milk from the cheese must be from a cow which um, was born in Salzburger Land, lived in Salzburger Land, was fed by um, grains from Salzburger Land. So that everything is really regional. And we even go to the hotel partners and say um, they get a kind of brand on it, on the hotel. And then they say they're re re definitely regional. And these hotels are only using products of regional and eco ecological or bio production. And I think we are here very, very um, on a good way because even in the city tourism, we, we try to invent this kind of regionality. And as you know, all in the in the city, in the mice, in the mice sector, often the last cent. Decides the, decides the decision, not the the value you got, get for the last cent. Okay, thank you. And Dave, if I could take it with you, um, I mean, you, you spoke there about how there's you know this, uh, this dump dump of uh, data dump essentially, and it's important to, to find the right data. What are some of the examples of the bad data? You think that maybe tourism businesses might be too inclined to focus on that uh, could you know that could be ignored essentially. Um, some of it's very specific to the individual. I don't think there's any such thing as bad data in the first place, Colin. Sure. Right? Um, but it's in how we use it. And, and, and some of the challenge we've got is in, in the scale. And, and, and our first speaker talked about a data lake. For, for the average tourism business, that is just something incomprehensible. Um, they want very simple answers. And one of the key things we're working with is, is how do you get straightforward insight as opposed to here is just all of this data. What am I trying to ask you? Um, so so there, there, there's lots of data out there. Um, it's about trying to find what are the business questions we're answering actually rather than the data. So, so it's easy to store, it's easy to put it into that dump, but we're just growing these things um, and we don't necessarily have the, the ability or the um, capability yet to farm that and to develop the insights. That's my passion. So, so no bad data, but actually back to data literacy and developing people who can actually develop the insights out of that. Hmm. And what have you found are the biggest stumbling blocks? Like I think it's especially in, yeah. in Ireland, both um, the border, there's issues of there's actually like broadband issues and connectivity. Yeah. I mean, are these the kind of things that you're finding? So, so connectivity is a challenge. Um, the lack of, of technology companies understanding the commercial opportunity of data. So we have lots of companies in Northern Ireland who work on data and ask me for my data and they'll develop me fantastic insights. We're not that mature yet. We don't necessarily have all the data in one place. So we're having to do lots of work to actually aggregate that data. The data resides with the actual stakeholders, so the tourism businesses themselves or the visitor or the mobile telephone companies. And actually farming and capturing the data is, is the challenge so far, um, not necessarily the capability to do something with it once we've got it. Okay, and is there any, and finally, is there any um, kind of platforms or technologies that you're particularly excited about to help transform tourism in, in Northern Ireland that's coming in the next few years, especially yeah. with COVID-19? Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I'm going to stop the temptation to talk about immersive technology and do all that exciting stuff. Um, sure. But 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 actually, for me, it's, it's artificial intelligence, it's machine learning. It's nothing that you won't expect, but it's using the data, teaching the systems to, to understand more. Um, and I've talked a little bit previously about having a Netflix for tourism, that it understands who I am, it knows where I am, it knows what I've already booked, and knows what's open and what's what's got availability, and should tell me and prompt me and push towards me. That's what gets me excited now. Great. All right, well, Vaughn and Dave, uh, thank you very much for, for taking your time there and for giving us some presentations and thoughts. Uh, we're now moving on to okay. our third third session, um, which will look at how new mobility solutions are totally changing how we interact with communities in a larger city and what we can do to bring us closer together. 
Now, as I had mentioned earlier, uh, Professor Carlos Moreno was supposed to be giving our presentation, but as things happen, the, his you know, travel disruptions have changed that. But we will have a video now uh, in a few minutes, just giving us his interpretation of what a 15 minute city is. And um, now Professor Moreno is an associate professor at the Sorbonne in Paris. Uh, and his work aims to promote the transformation of our lifestyle and urban spaces and to offer solutions to the issues faced by cities, metropoli metropolis and territories during the 21st century. Uh, Carlos was awarded the French Knight of the Order of the Legion of Honor in 2010. And in 2019, he received the Foresight Medal uh, from the French Academy of Architecture. So now we will be uh, teeing up his video to discuss what the 15 minute city is and his uh, thoughts in the future. La ville du quart d'heure, c'est l'humain au bout de la rue. C'est au cœur de la ville, mettre le cœur des hommes. C'est les services de proximité accessibles à tous, en moins des quarts d'heure, à pied ou en vélo. C'est la nature, la biodiversité, tout près de nous. Des rues piétonnes, des rues végétalisées, moins de circulation. C'est les écoles ouvertes sur les quartiers. La ville des quarts d'heure, c'est un lieu, plusieurs usages. C'est quitter la mobilité subie pour aller vers la mobilité choisie. C'est dire bonjour à tout le monde. C'est des services qui permettent de rendre une ville apaisée. C'est pouvoir vivre plus librement dans la ville, profitant de son quartier. C'est la ville pour tous. Before the recent lockdowns around the world, we led hectic lives with long commutes and not enough time to spend with our families and friends. Traffic polluted our air and smog blanketed our skylines. What if it could be different? What if we could create a new normal where we reclaim our time, our health and well-being, and our communities? This is the idea behind the 15-minute city, a growing movement to make our lives in cities more convenient, less stressful, and more sustainable. A 15-minute city is one where everything we need is close to home, where communities are safe and inclusive, where the air is clean. A 15-minute city is one where it's easy to get goods and services, fresh groceries, health care, and other amenities are all just a short trip away. A 15-minute city is one where everyone has a place. A 15-minute city has affordable, accessible, and adaptable housing for households of all sizes and ages. A 15-minute city means that you can work close to home or work remotely more often. And we all play a role in our neighborhood. What if we don't go back to life as it was? What if we already have the power to change how we live? Together, we can reimagine and create the future we want. One that is cleaner, safer, healthier, and more inclusive, and gives us back valuable time to enjoy the little things. Okay, that was great. Um, unfortunately, he's not here to discuss it further, but we do have a panel to now discuss some of those ideas in the 15 minute city. Um, we have Alan Murphy, who is a regional manager for Smart Dublin. We have Dr. Maria Jose Rojo, for the, who's a project manager and a coordinator for active travel and health at Polis in Madrid. And we have Caroline Bloomfield, who's the director for SUSTRANS Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. So I think we'll get a few questions going here, but if anyone in the in the audience would like to ask some questions and pose them to our panel, do let us know. Just let us know who you're addressing it to as well. That'll be great. Um, I think if I ask you first, uh, Dr. Rocco, about, you know, when we talk of a 50 minute city, uh, it's often thought of as a medium to long term strategy. Now, how do you think we can achieve a quicker wins, not only in response to, to COVID-19, but also to climate change and things like citizens health? 
Yes. Um, okay. As you said, the 15 minute looks at the long term, but it's true that it's urgent to take measures uh, in the short term as well. And I think this is compatible. Uh, regarding with behavior change, it's true that the, the COVID pandemic um, has had a very big impact. And as, as many behavior experts, uh, behavior change experts say, uh, these kind of life changing moments uh, have the potential to really make us uh, change our deep rooted behaviors, among them as well the uh, mobility behavior. So I think this is. is from the perspective of active travel, is in fact uh, an opportunity to ha to have this this change in mobility behavior, and also because we we have many many citizens have experienced no as it has been commented before cities without pollution with with uh, less noise more space so I think this is something that uh, we have to 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 use this opportunity. Uh, also, cities have, have demonstrated, and it's also been already mentioned during some of the presentations, for example, the Cork presentation, um, cities have been very agile and have very quickly implemented measures that before we thought that would be really very slow to implement or very complex, and, and cities, many cities have been very agile and demonstrated that they can uh, implement these measures quickly. Uh, so mainly to, to reallocate space, because other, another thing that has been uh, revealed by this pandemic is this very disproportionate uh, distribution of space in favor of motorized uh, traffic. And uh, so there's now a big, uh, I mean, according, for example, to one of the recent survey, it said that more than three quarters of, of the people that were uh, the participants said that they were in favor of reallocating space to, to promote active, active travel and to, to, to reduce the, the pollution in cities. So, so I think um, it's not uh, there's not it's not incompatible to have long term strategies and mix them with short term strategies, but the opposite because also um, uh, Joyce has mentioned in the presentation of course that it was because they had these long term plans that they could fast track them during the the crisis and then they could implement uh, measures. Uh, much quicker. It's because they already had the, their portfolio of measures, and th that's why many cities around mm, around Europe, and especially the ones that have been more successful and more quick in implementing these kind of measures, such as deployment of pop-up bike, la bike lanes or widening sidewalks, uh, they already had these kind of plans, and they could uh, fast track them during the the crisis. Right. And, and Caroline, um, COVID-19, you know, has, has upended urban mobility with many people using, like touching on there earlier with the car as a safety bubble because they're afraid of taking public transport or maybe just walking through cities. Uh, but it's also helped spur a redesign of, of our cities. I mean, how do we ensure like a lasting shift to sustainable mobility? And how does the 15 minute city support this, do you think? But thanks very much, Colm. I mean, we saw a massive shift of people uh, walking and cycling during the initial lockdown period. And this was, you know, if you, why was this? And I think one of the main reasons was that there were very few cars on the road. So people felt that the roads were safe for them to cycle uh, and walk on. And I think if we want to ensure a lasting shift active travel, we need to ensure that we have good, safe infrastructure backed up by behaviour change support. When we've seen a number of pop-up cycle lanes here in Belfast during lockdown, and they're very welcome, but I think they're really only a start. I mean, at the moment, our cities and towns have been designed around the needs of drivers and moving cars. Uh, now they really need to be designed around moving people. How, how do we create those livable cities and towns that, that we want to see? I mean, in, in Belfast, we can see that where we do have some good, safe infrastructure, uh, you know, whether it's a greenway or a cycle lane, it's, it's, it's really valued and it's heavily used. Uh, and, the, and, and they're used by all ages and abilities. And that's what I think is important. They're inclusive, safe spaces. Because if we want active travel to be for everyone rather than just the brave, which is really who it's designed for at the moment, uh, you know, if we want to have children, adults, people with disabilities, older people cycling and walking, we need to devote more space to it. And that may mean taking away space from, from, from vehicles. Uh, I mean, we know there are several groups that are underrepresented and we did a bike life report here in Belfast last year that showed that while 19% of men cycle once a week or more, only 5% of women do. 
And the two main reasons for that that were cited were safety and weather. Now, we can't do very much about the weather, but we can and absolutely should do something about the safety issue. And I think the 15-minute neighbourhood really supports that this vision. I mean, we, we want to see, we want to have places that connect us to each other and what we need and where everyone can thrive without having to, without having to, uh, to get in a car and drive somewhere. So this 15-minute neighbourhood really resonates with that. If you can get everywhere within a 15-minute walk, you don't need to drive. So, uh, I mean, I think it's a, it's a really interesting concept. And if they can do it in Paris... There's no reason they can't, we can't do it here in, in Ireland, you know, sure. north and south. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Alan, uh, prior to COVID-19, urban mobility was undergoing a real paradigm shift uh, with shared mobility and especially things like mobility as a service. Uh, but as we continue to deal with the pandemic, I mean, do you think now that maybe the disruptors have become the disrupted themselves? Yeah, I suppose, first of all, you, you have to kind of think about, well, who, who are the disruptors to make something like mobility as a service happen? Uh, and there's, there's multiple actors to make mass happen uh, in Ireland, for example, or in any city. Um, I think straight away, we, we think of the, the micro mobility operators, the, the bike schemes, the e-scooter schemes that are, are happening in most European cities. Um, car sharing schemes and, and so on, ride hailing companies and all that stuff. Um, have they been disrupted? A absolutely. I mean, in, in Dublin, for example, the utilization figures for our two dockless bike schemes have just gone gangbusters, gone, gone through the roof. Uh, maybe it was good weather. I, I think that it encouraged people to, to choose a bike to get around uh, the Dublin region. So, so their business model has just scaled up literally in a matter of months. Um, so, so they're a key actor to, to enable mass. But the, there's other actors that are, are key to deliver mass and always will be. So a big call out to, to local government. I mean, you heard from, from David Joyce from Cork as to the cycling infrastructure and pedestrianizations that, of, of certain streets that have happened in Cork. The same has happened in Dublin. I think some of the cycling infrastructure that's happened in Dublin is arguably world class. In fact, uh, in one of the councils in Dunleary Rathdown, they call it the coastal mobility route. It's not just a cycle lane. So the Caroline's point, it's more than just the brave uh, men in Lycra on, on racers flying down bike lanes. This, this is intended for, for families and for all kinds of mobility. So, so that, that's a big shout out to local government and how they've been disrupted and how they've used the COVID-19 opportunity to accelerate uh, the introduction of, of infrastructure, amazing infrastructure, to enable things like the bike sharing screens, which we would see as the initial disruptors. The other two actors maybe to call out as, as disruptors, again, that feed to the mass conversation, is the old school transport authorities, the bus companies, the Irish Rail, for example, uh, the Lewis operators, they've been massively disrupted by COVID. You know, their, their revenue and passenger, passenger numbers are, are down significantly. Um, and messages from government, central government, not to use public transport, for obvious reasons, has really impacted them. But what I'm seeing through conversations that, that we're having on the mass topic is that that, that pivot or that a disruption to their existing services has introduced uh, a culture of agility within those organizations. So Dave Vincent uh, on the tourism session uh, just previously talked about agility and the changing of culture to, to, to do things differently. So uh, I'd see a, a, a disruption there within those organizations that will ultimately lead to better um, better services once we get beyond this, this strange phase we're in. And then the final actor, but by no means least, is central government. So this is right up to the Minister of Transport. So we've just seen in the budget uh, an unprecedented commitment um, of, of millions to the tune of 360 million into cycling and pedestrian infrastructure. Um, this was sort of on the cards for some time, um, but I think that that commitment has been embolden emboldened by the uptick in the likes of cycling and walking that happened as a result of COVID. So long answer to your question, but there's, there's a number of actors 
um, that have been disrupted on the back of COVID, and they all play their part to to enable uh, the likes of, of mass uh, in Ireland in the future. Okay, great. Thanks, Alan. Uh, we have some questions who have come in here. Um, perhaps we can start with uh, Karina Hannon, who I, I'd say we could probably pose this to... Um, yeah, we could pose this to any of the panel, really, but uh, doesn't the population of our cities make having provisions available uh, in such close proximity financially inviolable? So Paris is a lot of concentrated area, which may make uh, many of the things that have been talked about in Smart City or the 15-minute city more viable than, say, a, a more dispersed city. I mean, uh, what would you say to that? Maybe we'll start with you, Maria, and if anyone else has some thoughts on that. Yes, I can say to that that of course, there's a, always a direct link between urban planning and the uh, uh, mobility options for or this, the mobility system of each place. So, of course, um, we have a, when we have more density, this means that uh, places are can be easily found closer, and then we can choose for more sustainable options like walking and cycling because everything is closer. But uh, in the last decades, we have had also urban developments that are designed around the car. So uh, this kind of, like, for example, this urban sprawl, which we know. So it, th those kind of urban fabrics are really, it's really a challenge to, to make them sustainable because they, from their design, they are, um, they are more dispersed and uh, it's, they are more dependent and more reliant on private vehicles. So I think, uh, yes, it's more, it's easier to, to apply the model of the 15-minute city to dense areas because by definition, uh, uh, urban fabrics that are um, sustainable are also complex, are, are dense, are diverse, and, and we still have a challenge in other areas which are more, more diverse, but we can also find uh, solutions to those, even if it's not uh, achieving the 15-minute the, the city. We can also... Uh, for example, intermodality has a role, a last minute uh, solutions. So, um, but it, I think it's, it's other, other approaches. To, mm -hmm. and, and there's in, indeed a link between density and, and urban it's, options. Uh, mm -hmm. And for maybe from quickly from an Irish perspective, Alan or Carolyn, is any thoughts on that question? Maybe j just to say, I, I think that the planning uh, has a really important role Looking at future developments, how do you build in? Uh, about how do we build in active travel? But how do you ensure that that areas are not just zoned for business or just zoned for housing, but actually that we have a much more holistic uh, approach? I mean, I live in Belfast, and I cannot walk to a shop. My nearest shops have well, I can, but it's a half bar walk. You know, so <laughs> there there must, there must be ways that we can design things a little bit better. Uh, then that's why I, I, I think planners have a really critical role to play going forward. And Alan? Yeah, um, I, well, if I could talk about Dublin for a second, like Dublin really is just a bunch of villages just all joined up. So um, or organically or historically, you know, there is a sort of local centre um, amongst um, many parts of, of Dublin. And... I heard a colleague of mine say, you know, that the COVID has been a tale of two cities almost. So that now that people are working from home, um, there's been a huge uplift in economic activity in that suburb, suburban area or, or village of Dublin, if you like. Um, but then the city centre, which had been given over to a lot of office blocks and all that development, has lost out. It's so been a hollowing out, or you know, of the city centre. Um, for all the traditional uh, reasons. So, I, I mean, going forward, the likes of a 15-minute city to happen in Dublin, I, I think is very doable because we have, we have the old historical um, village kind of set focal points uh, that we can build upon. I suppose the trick is to try and remove the, the commuting in, back into the city centre. Like, is that what we want when we come out of this? Um, and better thinking as to uh, where people work or where, where would be the location of their work. Um, again, huge question marks on, you know, will people continue working from home uh, in a material way? You know, maybe it's three days a week and two days commuting into the, the city centre into a, 
uh, an office HQ or something. So, so uh, I'd be optimistic about the 15 minute city concept in Dublin. Yeah. Okay. And uh, I guess this, this, we're, we're in short of time here, but I'll, there's a question for you, Alan, from Emma Bamford, uh, who's asking what, what data is available when looking at urban mobility disruptors, particularly on the bike sharing scheme. Schemes. Yeah, okay. Uh, on bike sharing, yeah. So um, as part of the Smart Dublin program, we're promoting open data. So we engage with the, uh, the bike sharing schemes to get uh, relevant data sets in terms of real-time availability of their bikes uh, around the region. So, so that, that data has been opened via our open data portal. It's called Dublinked. Uh, and then, of course, <clears throat> the, the, the users can go to the respective bike operators to see that kind of information as well. Um, but back to, again, to, I think it was the tourism uh, guy, Dave Vincent, talked about this, this tourism sort of data hub. Uh, that's something uh, in Dublin slash Ireland where we're trying to create this sort of integrated uh, view of mobility across all different um, modes of operation, uh, certainly for the Dublin region. And the bikes are, are just one part of that. Okay. And uh, again, Alan, you're the, you're the popular one, apparently. This, this <laughs> you know, there's... Uh, Oh, we were, this isn't this is an Irish uh, conference, so probably a lot of a lot of local uh, local interest, maybe. Yeah. Sure. This is uh, John Martin who's asking how much will all of this discussion around fifteen minute city and sustainability matter if all cars are electric? <laughs> um, well, it, it's 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 more of a quality quality of life thing. Mm. Is the fifteen minute city? So you can you don't have to waste time uh, commuting. That's that's one outlook on it okay evs you're going to have hopefully really good air quality uh, but we don't want like this but over two million private cars registered in ireland at the moment we don't want everybody switching from an ice vehicle to an ev vehicle we're just perpetuating the congestion assuming that there'll be some level of, of movement still around let's say the dublin region or cork or galway suffers from congestion big time um so evs have a role to play but but there's messages in the program for government. There's messages coming from the likes of us, and I'm sure from Maria and Caroline as well. It's all about user preference. We we want to we want to um, uh, introduce new modes of transport to, to people. Encourage active travel. If people choose to buy an EV, and they're expensive. If choose if people choose to buy an EV and use an EV, even just to go down to the shop. That, that's their choice. But hopefully people are, are, are more aware of other uh, ways to get around and they don't, they don't have to travel that far. So it's all kept within the 15 minute uh, kind of radius. Mm. Okay. Yeah, well, I, I, would, I would absolutely uh, back that up. I mean, obviously the climate change is one of the issues uh, that we want to address and electric vehicles have their place, but congestion is the other. I mean, Belfast is, is a, has been a very congested city and an electric car takes up as much space on the road as, as, a, as a regular car. So that'll not do anything uh, to ease the, how our cities feel and look. And I think if we want to make our cities more livable, it's about how do we uh, ensure that more people can get around uh, on foot or by bicycle. Uh, I mean, in Ireland, most of our towns and cities are, are quite small. It, 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 the distances are not huge. Uh, we, we know that this is more that this should be possible. I mean, we look at, in in Northern Ireland, fifty percent of primary school children live within a mile of their school. Yet at the moment, two thirds of them are driven to school. I mean, that's crazy statistics. Uh, so you know, saying well, with all of electric vehicles. But that's not going to help that. I mean, I think we need to be finding more ways of supporting people to walk and cycle, which is good for their health as well, and it, not as well as making the, 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 the city a, a better place to be. Mm. Uh, and just very briefly, because we're running short of time, Maria, maybe you can add in on that. I mean, in terms of EV adoption in Madrid and things like that, what's how's that been so far? Yes, I fully, I fully agree. So it's not, uh, uh, as Caroline said, it's, it tackles uh, pollution, but it doesn't tackle congestion. And uh, I think that the main one of the main issues here is space. Space is really the, the scarce, <laughs> scarce uh, element we have. And cities also have a um, have a very important role and have a lot of power as uh, managers of the space. And uh, to ensure that there's a balance between the different modes, there's I, I think there's uh, sufficient proof that 
uh, neighborhoods with less uh, cars are are more safe, are more quiet, uh, and give space for other kinds of activities, which is also uh, at the at the heart of the 15 minute city. So of course, AVs bring innovation and bring, uh, for example, in public transport, it's really uh, a very good application and also as 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 another mode. But I think yes, the, the congestion is is also a very important issue. Okay, great. All right. Well, uh, thank you very much, everyone, for, for the panel there. So we had Maria, and we had Caroline, and we had Helen. Uh, thanks very much for taking part and fleshing out ideas of the 15-minute city. Okay, so we're now on to our final session, uh, which will uh, discuss COVID-19 and the future of local governments and how it can be a catalyst for in innovation. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like at first like to welcome Anne-Marie Farley, Chief Executive for Fingal County Council. She was Fingal County Council's Director of Housing and Community from 2011 to 2015, uh, before serving as Director of Planning and Strategic Infrastructure from 2015 to 2019. Uh, she previously chaired the board of the Seamus Ennis Art Center and the Drennan Enterprise Center, and was a participant on the Senior Executives in State and Local Government program at Harvard University. Uh, after Anne-Marie then, we will hear from Dr. Jane Brady, MBE, Digital Innovation Commissioner for uh, Belfast City Council. She's a self-described engineer at heart with extensive board experience and a track record with blue chip corporations, startups, and funding ecosystems. She has a strong established professional network and is a fellow of both the Institute of Directors and the Institute of Engineering and Technology. So now let me hand over to Anne-Marie who will take us off. Good afternoon, everybody. Really pleased to join the conference today. And um, I suppose when I looked at the agenda during the week, it really is what every local authority is living right across the subject areas, trying to reimagine the place we're living in, trying to, I suppose, adapt to the COVID environment and the challenges it's placing on all of us. And then the economic challenges are incredibly difficult, mostly for the businesses within our local authority areas, but that transfers to ourselves as well as local authorities. Any impact or negative impact on business will have a, a negative impact on our own economic base as a local authority. Um, I was struck by, by on terms of some of the questions and conversations there in the last hour about, um, I suppose, necessity being the mother of invention was what came into my mind. I mean, a lot of what we're doing right now and trying to roll out right now is because we must, because we're, we're going to be living with COVID for, for the, at least the next year, let's say, and, and hopefully not too much beyond that. Um, it's also an opportunity, and I'm back to um, using it, using every opportunity to solve some of the the older problems. So when we talk about improve improvements to our to our open spaces and making cycling and walking easier, we're doing all of that because of COVID. But it's something that we wanted to do in any event. Um, so when we talk about improved cycling infrastructure in some of our areas, Dunleary has been held up as some wonderful projects delivered there. We're doing that right now because people can't use public transport to the same extent. We want to prevent um, um, car traffic on our roads to deal with COVID, but the long-term benefits hopefully will, will be with us for, for many um, years to come. And again, I suppose, to say perfection is the enemy of progress. We've had the opportunity of rolling out some of these projects because of COVID, because of the emergency, and they've helped our longer term objectives to get more people out walking and cycling and making our places a better place to live. Um, in Fingal, I suppose, for those of you who know it, it's a, it's, it's a large conurbation, you could say, of Dublin, but we have rural, coastal and urban areas. And for the first time, I suppose, predominantly our communities are staying in their local area and um, particularly at, in the earlier stage of the lockdown for that initial um, few month period and now heading back into it for six weeks. So as people are living in, in their homes and staying um, and working from home, what they're looking for is good quality open space. They want to be able to bring their children out for a cycle safely. Um, they want to go for the walk in their local area safely and they want places to dwell in their local area. So that whole pedestrianisation, providing more community space in the centre of our towns, changing the public realm is to do with people living and working in their local area. A long term, I suppose, planning objective 
and um, that we've all been trying to achieve, but difficult, you know, where you, where you have the heart of your economy up to now in the center of your city. So it's, it has developed um, and led to a lot of opportunities for ourselves. Um, however, it's not without its challenges. And um, whereas the initial projects, um, particularly the walking and cycling projects, were delivered easier than than the later ones because some some of the negatives have begun to to creep out from local communities. People don't necessarily want. Um, dwell time for communities beside their their homes you know they feel that that has a negative in, impact on their residential amenity um there's concern obviously where you lose trees for example when you're delivering cycleways so all of these challenges are coming back to the fore um but i think we have gained momentum and i think we will find that we can deliver projects easier than we used to as a local authority, we've had to adapt. We're um, presently today, tomorrow, we're again trying to get more people out of the office. We never went above 25% in recent months. But right now, we have to find a way of delivering essential services from home. Um, and in Fingal, I suppose we've been fortunate because we had commenced our digital transformation in advance of COVID. Um, and what was a two to three year um, implementation program became more or less a three month program. So right now we're, our customer service is answered from people's homes. People, that's where our customer service um, agents are, are located um, in their, their own homes and answering all calls from there. Um, all of our office staff have laptops and um, mobile phones available to them. And we're moving our telephone system onto MS Teams. We have three and a half thousand MS Teams meetings um, since we introduced it, and we only introduced it in late March, April. That's the way we're doing our business now. And I don't think we're any different to any organization. Um, but again, we're now moving, as we move through the maturity stage of that, we're now moving to dealing with the, the negative side of that, making sure that the the management piece is dealt with, making sure that the communication piece is dealt with, making sure that that loss of the collegiate approach to project planning isn't gone, that we that we can retain that as people try to, to do everything remotely. So again, we're learning as we move along, there's new problems arising, but um, the innovation that was delivered, I suppose, by my own IT department and by our corporate services department in a very short time frame, is what's standing us to us now as we face another six week period of level five restrictions where getting things done is, is harder. Um, and then I suppose back going back to the community piece, the quality of open space and delivering on that is more important than ever. Um, as I mentioned, people living at home People being educated from home has, has um, manifested in a problem where, where the digital poverty piece is becoming more evident in, in some of our towns. Um, so the likes of smart benches that um, have been rolled out through Smart Dublin, public Wi-Fi, um, remembering that our libraries are now closing again. Um, so that, that facility is no longer available to those that need those services um, other than online. Those, that public facility is really important and, and it becoming more and more well used. I think it was Alan mentioned the um, bleeper bikes earlier. We, the usage of bleeper bikes in Fingal, and bearing in mind that we have quite a rural um, county as well as the more urban areas of Malahide House, Swords, etc., and, and Dublin 15, that doubled. That, would, that, that peaked at about 7,500 per month. Um, in, in summertime, where people were basically using the opportunity to come out to the coast, um, come into our, some of our towns and villages, um, and using the bleeper bikes to do it. So it became an amenity in itself. Um, again, I suppose we're heading into a, a second lockdown, as I said, and some of the choices that were made earlier um, in March and April are no longer available to us. So we're heading into this six week period and there won't be a delay in the planning system. There was, you know, there was regulations introduced in March that said you can just stop your planning for, for the 12 week period. We don't, won't have that available to us now. 
whereas we're trying, many local authorities are trying to consult on development plans and other statutory processes. So the likes of, you know, 3D virtual reality and making sure that we can demonstrate and um, explain our plans to people in their homes is becoming more and more important. And that's something we've used as we brought greenways through the planning system in, in recent months and absolutely crucial right now when um, we don't want to encourage people to come to public offices or and they can't go to the libraries and other places um, in order to view plans and to see exactly what impact there might be on their local area. So the innovation piece and capturing what we can and delivering new ways of doing things quickly is absolutely crucial. Crucial um, as we as we face into the COVID environment, but do you know what? People are finding them more convenient. They're finding the fact that they can be demonstrated a plan online, um, and it's explained to them, and they understand the impact it will have on their area. They can make their comments, and if they're not available on for the precise time that that webinar is happening, they can look back on it and use it to inform their submissions. So there's a lot of advantages to this new thinking, this new way of working. Um, and again, a lot of a lot of a lot achieved quickly because we've had to to move ahead. Um, looking at your agenda again, just in terms of transforming tourism, never more needed, I suppose. In Fingal, um, we would have a lot of heritage properties. Any of the those local to the area will be aware of those, the likes of Malahide Castle, Newbridge House, our Gillen Castle. The visitor numbers there are down by um, 50% and revenues down 70%. So if we look into 2022, um, hopefully we can move towards getting back to normal. But for next year, there's, those visitor numbers are unlikely to change. We're relying on the local customer um, and we're relying on new ways of attracting um, that local customer into a facility that they may be well aware of but have never visited themselves so again how we approach that and what new approaches we take to delivering those visitors and also I suppose to driving the economy of those tour tourism facilities is crucial as we look forward. Um, I mentioned the economy and I suppose the issue um, that has faced all of our economies um, right across the world businesses opening closing um, not being sure of um, what their business model is right now, needing to go online quickly because the, their small retail offering won't be able to open during the, the, high, the highest restrictions. So there's been a lot of business supports rolled out directly to businesses. In Fingal, we've paid out 20 million in grants to businesses that have been impacted, either through reduced turnover or businesses that have had to close. But we've also supported a number of small businesses to get online. We suppose supported some enterprises that, um, that on a social economy basis, um, help small businesses to get online, to trade online, even if it is click on click collect, but at least to be able to demonstrate the goods they have available for sale. And as you think about heading into the Christmas um, period, um, that's going to be absolutely crucial for those small businesses so that they will, will reopen because most of them, um, when they face into a January um, situation, would find that trading environment very challenging at any time. Um, so to to not have benefited from the Christmas trading period and then think about whether they will open in January or not. If they don't get the supports that they need, then there's a, I have a real fear that many of them won't be in a position to reopen. So as a local authority, then the obligation to move quickly, to move with pace, to set up your restart grant, which is the 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 Irish government's version of um, business support for those impacted by COVID, to set it up quickly to get your system automated, to make sure that it's an easy to use system, an easily understood system, so that that money reaches um, businesses' bank accounts quickly is absolutely crucial. And again, that's something that if it wasn't done quickly, it would have been of a lot less value to the businesses. And that's the type of innovation that has been delivered, I think, across local authorities this year. Um, I think it's really uh, helpful. I'm, I'm really sorry, just uh, <laughs> need to uh, wrap up now in a, in a minute or two. Okay, well, I'll, I'll leave you just with the thought of um, the bringing innovation to, to everything we do, but bring it 
at speed, particularly when you're faced with a pandemic. And I think the fact that we've had this type of thinking in, in this these types of seminars before has helped us to do that. And the fact that we're talking to each other will help us to learn from each other and to benefit from the thinking that has happened elsewhere. Thank you very much. And I'll hand over to Jane now. Thanks, Anne-Marie. That's a great segue into uh, the next few minutes where I'm going to talk about the criticality of innovation. And actually, I'm, I'm a recruit um, of COVID. Um, my role is Belfast Digital Innovation Commissioner, and I took up this role during the pandemic. I think it's testament to our council leaders, and Belfast City Council in particular, and their foresight in recognising just how vital digital innovation, which Anne-Marie just so eloquently illustrated, is both in the recovery um, but also in developing long-term strategic economic strategies that are inclusive and sustainable for all. I guess what's been key to us is the element of collaboration with our city partners, our members, councillors, businesses, communities. And actually, that's why it's really important today to be here at this event, albeit an online event using digital innovation uh, with our local government and smart city partners um, across the regions. Um, so my previous role, um, as was mentioned by Colin, was in the private sector. So um, I was involved in venture capital partner across 80 portfolio companies across the island of Ireland. And this is my first move into the public sector uh, for the first time in 25 years. However, as I chart kind of the digital innovation strategy, there are many corollaries between my previous role. Both are based on developing compelling investment strategies, directing our regional strengths to address what global opportunities and challenges that we now face. And core to these is ensuring these strategies deliver an economic impact, but with my public hat on to make sure that these are inclusive and they're sustainable for all. And we've all been impacted by the pandemic, our families, our jobs, ways of life. However, what has been clear is the role that digital innovation has played in ensuring we've navigated the crisis and how important it's going to be in developing that resilient strategy to underpin our future growth. Um, and studies have shown that actually um, the best time to grow differentially from an innovation perspective is when aggregate growth is low and the current pandemic, in my view, is not a reason to postpone innovation and investment. Indeed, it's in addition to helping us navigate uh, through the crisis, it's a critical pillar to chart our recovery. And as we've all seen, pandemics have forced faster innovation, they accelerate the curve and provide strong tailwinds. In fact, in Satya Nadja's earnings call at Microsoft, he said, we've seen two years worth of digital transformation in two months. And I think we're all can pay testament to that. So in many cases, the basics for innovation have been figured out. However, as we now move into our uh, responding and also recovering uh, strategies, investing in innovation will be a critical pillar. And I guess it makes sound commercial sense and is a defining characteristic of successful economies. The benefits extend far beyond the innovative businesses, growing clusters, creating jobs, creating new skills pathways, and encouraging foreign direct investments. And countries and regions that fail to invest in R&D are less wealthy, less productive, and less competitive. And invest in innovation means investing in the whole economy. In the North, every one pound of investment in terms of R&D and innovation, it generates seven pounds in terms of gross value add. And I'm sure we've all seen uh, within our, our regions and, and our communities, innovative companies that have been more resilient to economic shocks and have made them more competitive and better place to reskill workers. In the current crisis, as with the global financial crisis, innovative companies are providing significant reskilling opportunities, helping those whose jobs have been affected to gain future focus skills. And in Belfast City Council, we have a very solid platform to build on. The City of Belfast has a strong ambition to catalyze digital innovation to increase the region's productivity. And we have a strong uh, track record in terms of innovation, and engineering firmly grounded in our grassroots entrepreneurship. In the past number of months, we have seen the very welcome investment from UK government in terms of a billion dollar commitment into city deals. And this provides us with a compelling platform from which we need to develop truly inclusive and sustainable industrial strategies with innovation and work. And our two universities in Ulster and Queens are more efficient than the UK peers of turning research into economic wealth. Our Belfast cybersecurity cluster now employs 1,600 security professionals and generates around 16 million per annum in the local economy. And I guess this long-term strategic investment in innovation has resulted in Belfast being the number one centre for US cyber FDI 
investment. And in the last number of months, uh, a ranking by FDI placed Belfast as the top, the ninth and top in terms of top European cities of the future, based on economic potential, startup innovation and FDI, and in fintech, we're ranked top three globally. And while many sectors have suffered job losses and sharp declines in sales, the tech sector within Northern Ireland has been resilient in responding to the challenges presented by COVID. Belfast-based fintech company, uh, Fintry, has created 200 new jobs since the introduction of COVID-19 restrictions in March, with 98% of the workforce working currently um, at home. However, particularly following the announcements that we've all experienced across uh, the island in the last week, I'm not underestimating the scale of the challenge. Investing in innovation, as underpinned by the city deals, will be crucial as we look to rebuild our economy. But innovation policy should not simply be a return to business as usual. Due to the asymmetric impact of the economic disadvantage during the crisis, there is a real need to expand priorities beyond traditional GDP growth. Economic recovery not only has a rate, it also has a direction. And this is an opportunity to embed the structural changes to develop a more sustainable, dynamic and inclusive economy. The economic impact of COVID-19 has brought into sharp focus urgent skills challenges for Belfast. Our existing challenges remain, though exacerbated, and structural changes to our economy are the dilemmas. The skills required for a post-pandemic world, digital skills, design thinking, entrepreneurship and innovation will be crucial to Belfast recovery. Our ability to build the digital capacity of our workforce is there for essential. We in Belfast City Council and our partners are in developing inclusive strategies on our solid platform of innovation, skills and resiliency. And whilst we acknowledge the significant challenges, we're committed and ambitious for the opportunity ahead. But critically, we're doubling down on our commitment to deliver a proactive, forward-looking digital innovation strategies that will tilt the playing field in directions where both business and society can win. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Um, so I think that that comes to the end of our of our talk today, the uh, All Ireland Smart Cities Forum. So thank you very much to uh, Anne Marie and to Jane there for uh, giving us their thoughts from Fingal City Council and Belfast City Council. So uh, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for. It. But don't worry, all materials from today's event uh, will be posted to the AISCF website and LinkedIn page over the coming days. And do keep an eye out um, on the website for upcoming events before the end of the year, virtually, most, more than likely. And if you have any more thoughts on what you've seen today or just want to share your thoughts, just you can share it with the hashtag again, hashtag AISCF20. So our serious thanks to all the speakers and panelists who gave their time to participate in the event and share their expertise today. Uh, thanks again to all the delegates for zooming in uh, to join us. And a big thank you to the organising committee for putting this event all together on behalf of the All-Ireland Smart Cities Forum uh, members. So we have Ashling Highland of Fingal City Council. We have Claire Davis of Cork City Council. Uh, sorry, Fingal County Council, I should say. Claire Davis of Cork City Council and Paul Fee of Belfast City Council. Uh, thanks also to Ashling Nennon of Smart Dublin and Connor Kelly of Galway City Council for their initial inputs into the event. And finally, thank you, a big thank you to Anne Hamilton Black and Orla Dunn and uh, Caroline Creamer and everyone else behind the scenes. Uh, you know, they're from the uh, Anne Hamilton Black and Orla Dunn of the Maynooth University Social Sciences Institute for uh, coordinating all the logistics of today's event. So finally, again, I'd like to say thank you very much. Goodbye. <laughs>